This is your weather now. I'm Sally Jaramillo with your weather now. Mostly clear skies tonight, but hazy skies look to persist for Monday, especially over the Great Basin. We want to show you your current temperature, 94 degrees, humidity up to 11%. Checking out those wind speeds, we saw them earlier being a bit gusty. West Southwest for Las Vegas staying at 7 miles per hour, 9 for North Las Vegas, and tracking south winds up to 13 miles per hour. For Nellis, you can see cooler 90s right now. Coming up my full forecast, we're going to be talking more about the return of monsoonal moisture. 8 News Now at 11 starts now. Now at 11, an exciting moment for students and teachers as they get back to learning inside the classroom tomorrow after a year away. How you can make sure your children are prepared. And Nevada upping efforts to get people tested and vaccinated. Madison Kimbrough joins us with more on a drive through site that's open late. Plus, it's a wrap. The Tokyo Summer Olympics are officially over. We look back at the challenges athletes and officials faced. We are live local now. Now. This is 8 News Now Weekend Edition. Live, local, now. In less than 12 hours, hundreds of thousands of students will be back in the classroom. Thank you for joining us tonight at 11 o'clock. I'm Sasha Loftus. A majority of students registered for in-person learning after a year away. Now, masks will be required for students and staff while indoors and on school district buses. CCSD says mask exemptions can be made if a student has a medical or developmental condition. A special meeting will be held before that happens, though. And while many students are excited to get back to the routine of school due to distance learning last year. This will mark the first time some kids have ever been inside a classroom. Today we spoke to one mom who says it will be an adjustment for her youngest son. I think he would have fun and just be adjustment to him. He's very shy, so he probably won't talk to the teacher that much, but I know he would get his work done. Davis says she's also preparing for the back to school traffic tomorrow. If your child has taken the bus, CCSD is encouraging parents to download the onboard bus app, which allows you to track where it is and see all of the pickup and drop off information. And speaking of traffic, local officials want to make sure students get to the classroom safely. They're reminding drivers to be cautious, especially in neighborhoods and near those school zones. Students should pay attention to the traffic signals and, of course, stay inside the crosswalk. And if your child rides their bike to school, be sure they always wear their helmet. CCSD police spoke to us about the importance of all these precautions come tomorrow. So far this year, we've had 38 fatalities for pedestrians. So those are just people who are out, you know, walking, riding their bikes. So we just really need to remind everybody to please slow down, pay attention. And to the pedestrians out there also, we always like to stress, use the crosswalks. They're here for a reason. The Red Cross recommends students arrive to the bus stop a little early and to stay away from the curb, of course. They also encourage families to create an emergency plan so everyone knows who to contact and where to go if something happens while children are at school and parents are at work. And we have answers to a lot of your questions, from food to bus routes and school supplies. That's on our website, 8newsnow.com. Just look for our back to school story. As COVID cases continue to surge across Nevada, the efforts to get more people vaccinated is ramping up. A free drive through site is offering shots and vaccines for the second week in a row, and many were out in full force today. Madison Kimbrough was there and joins us live in the newsroom with the latest. Madison. Yes, people took full advantage of the services offered at UNLV's Stan Fulton Building today as the drive through testing and vaccination site just closed for the day about 30 minutes ago. Now, according to staff I spoke to, the goal is to have this testing site open until the end of September, operating on a first come first serve basis while supplies last. I feel it's it's very convenient for a lot of people to be able to, you know, come here and be able to simply just stay in the cars and, and have a drive through. Um, it's faster. Clark County and the Southern Nevada Health District have come together with other county organizations to provide free drive through COVID-19 testing and vaccinations to the masses. As case numbers rise across the county, this drive through method makes it extremely convenient for those to get tested or vaccinated. I'm fully vaccinated, but we just came back from vacation, so it's more of a precautionary thing for both of us because we don't want to bring something back to people that we're going to be around. The site has about 300 doses of vaccine and 500 tests each night of operation. That's Sunday through Thursday from 5.30 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. Many people have been arriving early to get a good spot in line. I was told that they're going to start at 5.30 and to be here around 4. 
so I can be one of the first. There will be three COVID vaccines available, Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson's Janssen, which is one shot. Vanessa Rodriguez, who waited in line, says it's vital for her family to do their part after experiencing so much loss due to this virus. My husband and my father passed away within 24 hours of each other, so for us, the, the services being offered and us taking advantage of it and just making sure, like I said, to keep everybody around us safe. And officials suggest that if you do come out, register online before at the Southern Nevada Health District website. This will help the line move faster. Also, if you want to get tested or vaccinated, there is a walk-up option at this site, too. Reporting live in the newsroom, Madison Kimbrough, 8 News Now. And Madison, there will be more pop-up clinics offering vaccines this week. Becker Middle School will open for vaccines on Tuesday and Wednesday from 4 to 6 p.m. The Golden Nugget Casino, they'll offer vaccines on Wednesday from 9 to 11 in the morning. Then on Thursday, the Silverton Casino will be offering COVID shots from 8 to 11 a.m. No appointments are necessary for any of these locations. And for more information about this and several other vaccine clinics and testing sites all around the valley, you can head to our website, 8newsnow.com. In other news tonight, a two-car crash in the East Valley left one person dead today. This happened on Lamb near Charleston this afternoon. We're told a man driving one car was taken to Sunrise Trauma, where he died. Police say the other driver was arrested for a suspected DUI. That road was closed for a while today, but has since reopened. Meantime, Metro Police are investigating a homicide near the UNLV campus. This happened around 1 a.m. near Maryland Parkway in Flamingo. When officers arrived, they found a man in the driver's seat of the car with multiple gunshot wounds. He died on scene. According to Metro, the victim was sitting in the car while speaking to the suspect who shot him, then ran away. Officers are still searching for that person. If you have any information, please contact Crime Stoppers. A large fire broke out this afternoon at an apartment building on Sandy Lane. That's near Pecos and Las Vegas Boulevard. Fire officials tell 8 News now several agencies responded and those inside were evacuated. No one was hurt and the fire is still under investigation. Metro police are asking people to stop leaving their dogs in locked hot cars. Las Vegas Police Captain Dory Corrin posted a video on Twitter of a dog in distress today. The tweet reads, it's too hot to leave your pets in the heat. The captain says it was 108 degrees when police found the dog panting and struggling to breathe. Captain Corrin says Metro got there on time to rescue the animal. The community came together today to support our fallen heroes with a car wash fundraiser in the South Valley. Organizations joined efforts to raise money for the Injured Police Officers Fund. It was all in honor of NHP Trooper Micah May and Metro Police Officer Jason Swanger. Trooper May died just over a week ago after he was hit by a carjacking suspect on July 27th. Officer Swanger passed away on June 24th from COVID complications. We're just so grateful for the community. For their, for their love and support for our fallen and um, for the families at their trying time right now. The IPOF raises money to help police officers and their families in the event of a line of duty injury or death. If you want to make a donation, we have that link on our website, 8newsnow.com. As the Tokyo Olympics came to a close, organizers aren't just looking at the medal count. They say the COVID numbers inside the Olympic bubble show the games went off successfully. Melissa Marino is in Tokyo with more tonight. There were moments we thought the games may not happen. There were major concerns about spreading COVID-19, but organizers say their efforts worked. As we extinguished the Olympic flame. Which suggests that this has been, as promised, a safe and secure games. Dr. Brian McCloskey, who helped lead the Olympic bubble, says it was a massive undertaking. More than 600,000 COVID-19 tests were administered. And since July 1st, only 430 people and 29 athletes related to the games have tested positive. It was a huge amount of work for a, a very hardworking team. All of this, despite the fact that COVID numbers in Tokyo are at record highs. Dr. McCloskey says it wasn't just vaccines, social distancing, or wearing a mask, rather a combination of health and safety measures that worked. The important bit is it's the whole package of doing the public health measures and the testing. He says it's an important lesson he hopes the rest of the world learns from. And what Tokyo has just done in a historic way is proved that that advice is the right advice. And by following basic public health measures and by layering on top of that the testing program, 
we have shown it is possible to keep a pandemic at bay. In Tokyo, I'm Melissa Marino. Well, coming up next at 11 here on 8 News Now this Sunday, a heartbreaking story of a grandmother searching for answers. The I-team digs into the mysterious death of a child placed in foster care. Sally. Periods of slightly diminished visibility due to smoke during the morning hours Monday, along with more breezy winds. And get ready, the return of monsoon of moisture. We are live local. Sponsored by Silver State Refrigeration and HV. This is 8 News Now Weekend Edition with Sasha Loftus, Sally Jaramillo, and John Treach. 8 News Now Weekend Edition, live, local, now. Questions surround the death of a newborn baby who died in foster care. The I-Team has uncovered a document which reveals the foster parents were previously investigated for neglect in an unrelated case more than two years ago. In an exclusive interview, the child's grandmother is looking for answers. As Vanessa Murphy reports, this isn't the first tragedy for the family this year. This is ECI Joel. The only thing that you want is justice. This is ECI's grandmother. She's asked the I-team to protect her identity. Last April, her daughter was stabbed to death in a parking lot right in front of her. Metro police say the killer is her ex-boyfriend. She was a new mom to baby ECI. The grandmother says Child Protective Services, or CPS, took custody of the infant the same day. She says she expected they would soon be reunited, and in the meantime, she prepared to permanently care for him. I need my grandson back because I'm going to be ready, okay, to help him. She says she repeatedly reached out to a CPS caseworker to ask to be reunited with her grandson. I am ready to get him. I'm ready. And I was very happy, okay? He never returned my messages. She tells the I-team she finally received a call from the Clark County Coroner's Office. He said, no, I have bad news for you. And he told me that he's dead. I scream. I scream. 
I was very mad. She says no details about the child's death were shared with her. The I team dug for answers and found that, according to the coroner's office, at two months and 14 days old, ECI died at University Medical Center after an incident in the master bedroom of a foster family assigned to care for him. That's 26 days after the grandmother says CPS took custody of him. ECI's cause of death is pending. We also obtained this child fatality disclosure, which states the Department of Family Services received a report that the child had been found unresponsive in his crib by his foster parent. It also states that the same foster parents were previously investigated. A report was received alleging neglect in 2018 for at least one other child in their care. The allegations in that case were found unsubstantiated. Our clients uh, need to know what happened. Attorney Andre Lago Marcino is representing the family, although a lawsuit has not been filed. They need to proceed with all the natural processes of grieving and getting answers. The I team reached out to CPS for answers. In an email, a spokesman wrote that CPS is awaiting the coroner's report. The foster parents have not been charged. Their license is on hold and under investigation, and they currently do not have any foster children. When we asked why CPS isn't sharing information with the grandmother, we were told that confidentiality requirements preclude CPS from sharing information with her without parental consent. Again, the child's father is charged with murder. Records show he's currently going to be transferred to a mental health facility. And the child's mother was killed. As she grieves the loss of her daughter, the grandmother is in disbelief about the loss of her grandson. In my heart, I think he's not dead. It's not easy. It's very hard. I love him. Vanessa Murphy, 8 News Now. The I team followed up an additional three times asking about the confidentiality regarding the child since the mother is deceased. And according to records, the father has been declared not competent for trial. No additional response or explanation was received. Well, turning to our weather tonight here at 11 o'clock, Sally, we've been dealing with haze and smoke and all kinds of stuff, not wrapping up quite yet, but maybe coming around the mountain, right? That's right, <laughs> Sasha. Hazy skies, smoke lingering all the way into your Monday. Overall, the weekend, that was the primary concern. Very unhealthy air quality for tomorrow. We look to kick back into the moderate reading for the start of the week. But we do want to let you know from that 105, today we increased to 107. Here's a look at what's headed for the next few days we still have one more day of hazy breezy and above average temperatures the return of monsoon and moisture no longer on vacation and then we're going to talk more about those winds increasing storms flash flooding chances possible mainly for your weekend we're going to let you know today those lows would be of 81 degrees every time we reach the triple digits or higher silver state refrigeration hvac is giving hundred dollars to vets and pets outside right now tracking plenty of 90s we'll start with summerlin 93 downtown 97 green Valley also 97 mountains edge 92. A lot of you guys tweeting me on social media that you guys stayed indoors that you guys didn't want to go out this weekend because of those hazy smoky skies. You did very well. Param 90 Sandy Valley 88 for you right now and we'll still track those clear conditions temperatures dropping into those cooler 80s around that 4 a.m. Start. We'll show you the return of monsoon and moisture mainly impacting our friends in Arizona. Eventually slight chances pushing in for the work week, but you could see the Las Vegas Valley doesn't seem to be that impacted. It mainly looks to kick in as early as into the weekend. It mainly kicking in for the higher terrain around that Tuesday, Wednesday, and even Thursday. But Las Vegas, you could potentially start to see that increase in moisture mainly around Sunday into Monday. Wind speeds will be light and variable back again, increasing those breezes, gusts peaking mainly in the afternoon. It can go all the way up to 20 miles per hour. And as we head, we get ready for school, off to school, 81 degrees for that 6 a.m. start. South Southwest winds will be staying 7 miles per hour, heading home around that 2 o'clock hour, a high of 107, reminding you to drink plenty of water where that sunscreen. Here's a look as we drop those temperatures around Tuesday into your Wednesday. 101 looking very nice tonight. 81 degrees haze before 10 p.m. and even after that 1 a.m. start. And a closer look at your next eight day forecast. We do show you haze and gusts peaking up to 24 miles per hour for Monday. Eventually that moisture does increase. Once again, showing you those better chances will most likely be around Saturday, Sunday and even into Monday. Back to you. 
Sally, some traffic news for you. Preparations for the demolition of the aging Desert Inn Road Bridge begin tomorrow. Drivers should expect several lane and ramp closures between Boulder Highway and Flamingo. And I'll ask those using the roads to be careful and find another route if you can. Head to 8 News Now for a full list of dates, times, and areas closed. And before you head out on the road, John is joining us now with a historic day of sports in Las Vegas. John. That was a great bridge. Thank you. Thank you. It really was, and we didn't see it coming completely. We'll have the news <laughs> that is shaking the UNLV athletic infrastructure, plus the Raiders and fans in the same building. Oh, we're talking about that big building. Sports is next. now. The earth is shaking in college athletics and UNLV is at the epicenter. Athletic director Desiree Reed Francois is leaving Las Vegas and taking the AD job at Missouri. Reed Francois arrived at UNLV in April of 2017. It was her first big break as an AD. In four years, she moved ambitiously, replacing head coaches in a myriad of sports, including football and basketball twice. Reed Francois's passion was the student athlete experience, and it was upgraded during her tenure. The 49 year old with a law degree now moves into the cutthroat SEC, where she'll have a big budget and big expectations at Mizzou. <clears throat> it was a sight to behold Allegiant Stadium swarming with silver and black. The Raiders practiced at their home stadium in front of fans for the first time in Las Vegas history. It wasn't full, but it was fulfilling, thrilling even. The Raiders had fans in the stands and the Raiderettes on the field. Yes, this was a big deal. The people came to the palace painted and eager to see their team play in the $2 billion building. The Raiders kept their football preparation light, but Raider Nation still got to see Derek Carr connect with his wide receivers and the team connect with the town. That's why I came back to coach, uh, especially with the Raiders. It's always been, you know, the best time of my life. and. Um, to share it with Raider fans again for the first time in a long time was, was special. And I just can only imagine what it's going to be like when Seattle comes in to start the season. It'll be uh, uh, very loud, I would expect. For us as players, I, I think having the fans around again, it just creates that atmosphere that we all crave so much. 
and um, I, it was it was quite enjoyable. And I, I can't wait to see this thing sold out and packed. And you know, our fans always bring the juice. Long before Tom Flores entered the Hall of Fame, won two Super Bowls as the Raiders head coach, and became a silver and black icon, he was the son of a Mexican immigrant that earned everything. Today, he delivered humility and humor, as always. And the reason I'm second on the program tonight is that I'm 84 frapping years old. I've got to go to bed at 9 o'clock. Baby, where's my pillow? <laughs> Being here today, this enshrinement means the world to me. My journey became, began a long time ago when my father, as a 12-year-old, migrated to Central Valley in California with his family. Charles Woodson is one of the greatest defensive backs of all time. He joined the stage with Flores. He started and finished his career as an Oakland Raider, but the inspiration came from his mother, Georgia, a single mom who always came up clutch. Look no further than my mama to find out where I get it from. My passion, how hard I work, that comes from my mother. <clears throat> I watched her every day as a, as a child get up, work her fingers to the bone. What a great tribute. The NBA Summer League is a two week basketball bonanza. The festival atmosphere is a challenge during a pandemic, but they're making it work. Aside from a mask mandate, they also partner with Clorox to ensure ultimate cleanliness, not only for the fans, but for the 30 teams competing. During the event, they have an official clean team that comes in between every game and sprays down the team benches. They're trying to develop a new blueprint for anyone going to an event and how to safely enjoy the experience. Warren and I have been really grinding in our teams. We've been grinding on this for literally 24 months, you know, since 2019, since the last time we've been in this building. At the end of the day, everybody's happy to be here, especially the players, the teams, obviously the NBA. Just want fans to know, look, it's safe, it's clean, and we've done everything we can protocol-wise to make it a best uh, safe and, and reassuring environment. And at the same time, we're going to see some electric hoops. Las Vegas Aviators hosting the Salt Lake Bees. The Bees were in town, but today's game felt more like Bumble. Singles were everywhere. The Aviators had a season-high 21 hits, 18 of which were singles. And clearly ready to mingle at home. 11-1, to 1, the Aviators beat the Bees. They'll play again tomorrow. And today is International Cat Day. Congratulations to all the cats, but I get it. You're disinterested. So word from Finn, the bat boy dog of the aviators. Finn would like to know if your cat can obediently retrieve a bat without ever taking off into the crowd. He'd also like to know if your cat can track down a frisbee on a 40 yard sprint. Finally, Finn wonders if your cat cares about anyone other than itself. Finn didn't think so, but wishes you a happy and healthy cat day. I think we need a Finn day. We need to fin the bat dog day because he's pretty fabulous. That's absolutely true. Right? He's great. I love him. Fav best part of the games. All right. Well, still ahead, we are heading to Ireland tonight to meet a walrus who has gained some serious fame on social media.
now at jobs.autonation.com. Live, this is 8 News Now. Weekend edition. Well, finally, here at 11, meet Wally the Walrus. He's a local celebrity in Ireland who was recently spotted climbing into a boat in Ardmore Bay. He first gained his fame back in March and has since been spotted wandering the coasts of Britain, France, and Spain. Look at him still getting in that boat. He's determined. The video of Wally making himself comfortable on this inflatable boat has gone viral on social media. I can understand why. According to Declan Murphy, who filmed this, it is still a mystery why the walrus is wandering warmer waters alone. Honestly, I'm surprised that that he actually makes it in. It's taken him a while. The boat stays upright. You think it would kind of fall over? He looks like me on the lake after I've had pizza. <laughs> right. Right? I mean, that's John on a that's Monday how night. I'm just trying to trying to get back <laughs> after eating takeout. Boat. Yeah. <laughs> that's all of us. It's exhausting. <laughs> all right. Well, we're going to go eat pizza now. That's it for us. We'll see you next weekend.